Howdy! So this is my first video, therefore you know it's going to be awful. But hey, something has to be first, right? So I am going to attempt to make an Elder Wand. Uh, I have done this successfully in the past, so there's promise and hope. And I'm going to attempt to make two of them, that way if one of them breaks halfway through, I can just pretend that I was always going to make one of them. So, this is a uh, log of peach wood, I believe, my buddy gave me. And uh, I'm going to make it out of that. So, I found a pattern online. It has since gotten very wet, but... As you can see, it shows uh, rough size and all that kind of thing. And I believe this one's 14 inches long. Yes, 14 inches long, which somebody did some research and that's how about how long they think it is. So that's how long I'm going to make it. So we need a nice, straight, not free 14 inch piece of wood. And it only needs to be about three quarters of an inch in diameter once I turn it on the lathe, but it needs to start out quite quite a bit bigger than that. So to be safe, so we've got a pretty nice spot. There's a knot down here, but that gives us there's a knot there, but I bet we have some pretty nice wood in there. Uh, if you look at the end here, there is a crack. It goes down to the pith, but the rest of this is solid. I just I cut the end off this earlier. It did look it looked a whole lot more like that. Um, so in reality, we only need 14 inches, so I can cut it off right here. Um, it's always good to have a little bit of extra slack, especially uh, since I don't know where the knots are going to be. So I might go about 18 inches, go right about there. So... Yeah, let's go cut that off. All right, it's not the best angle for my phone, but you can see it. So, doesn't have to be exact, just needs to be about 18 inches. And this isn't gonna be perfectly square, but it'd be all right. So let's cut this off. cracks on this side. Oh, it looks good. Oh, there's some spalting in there. How about that? I'll be covering that up with stain anyway. But hey, no cracks at all in the middle. That's nice. All right, let's move back over to the bandsaw. Yeah, okay, I lied. I said bandsaw, but I want to run this through the jointer a little bit to get the flat edge on it. That way it doesn't spin on me when I put it in the saw. Don't really care where well, there's a little knot of cut off, so I think I'll try to take that flat. <laughs> Some square edges on it that way I can cut it on the bandsaw without it rolling around on me. Uh, definitely don't want the pith because uh, that's where cracks all come from. So we'll have to measure this out. I'll uh, start another video once I figure out what I'm doing. All right, so already I'm seeing what I should have done was use this crack 
make sure I was parallel with it. That way I could cut like that. But since we don't need, I could probably take a piece here and use this one. And then cut this one into two more blanks. So I don't think I'm going to get four out of it just because of this crack. I, if I'd been more careful, I might could have. But if we go this way, see, you don't want the pith in there. So yeah, maybe you're interested in seeing how I do this. So I'll probably end up speeding this up. If you're trying a bigger log, you really want to avoid that whole middle, like probably out to about here. But that's not going to leave me with a whole lot of wood. And this log's been drying on my back patio for about a year or so. And we'll I'll check the moisture in it in a minute. So, so, All right, so if I cut that, I'll cut through that crack. And I'll end up with a decent blank right there. This side, it's going to be right there. It'll be about the same distance from the pith. And uh, leave me with a good chunk over here. didn't go too far. Well, I guess it's under the bark here. Take a look at it. Yeah, it didn't go all the way, but it went pretty far. So, um, I'll just pull that off. I just can't do anything with it. And, uh, take the rest of the bark off of here. So I started this project using a piece of apple that uh, he gave me, same guy. And um, it's much softer wood. And I think turning something narrow like a wand, like I'm afraid I'd get near the end and then it would fall apart on me and I'd uh, be rather aggravated about it. So figure I can use this peach wood. I think it's peach, maybe pear, but I think it's peach. Actual like fruit tree, uh, which you know maybe I ought to put, just put in the smoker. I don't know, but it's pretty wood. So there are some some knots in there, but hopefully they won't weaken it too much. So this is the side I was kind of wanting to salvage because I already cut the pith out I'm on that side of it. So this ball thing is kind of pretty, but I'm not sure it's going to run through it very much. So since I'm putting this on the lathe, I don't need it to be square. I just need it to be straight. Um, so let me get it on the joiner just to make sure it's straight, all right? So I'll go back over here. Sorry for the shaking. Mm -hmm. completely straight I'll take it that is just rolled back just a little but that is okay with yeah, me. So since it's only an inch and a quarter thick is that true on both sides yeah um, I'm just gonna cut the wings off because I'm gonna try to mark it I'm not sure no I'm just gonna Freehand it. Okay, so it was starting to look like a piece of lumber almost. 
But now, we need to check the moisture level on it. Be back in a second. All right, I got the old moisture meter out. And 15%, 14 15%, 17%. Yeah. No, the density. I don't think peach is in here. Poplar, they've got is a two. This might be the same as poplar. Oak is a four. I'm going to go three. What if we go to four? Still 14%. Now it's saying 11 up here. 15. 15. Not, I don't think this is as dense as oak. I think three was probably a good number. If you haven't used one of these before, I wish I could just magically to it, but it has this chart in the book. And uh, since most of these are from other countries, at least the ones I can afford, uh, the types of trees they list are not necessarily... So they have Philippine mahogany. I don't have... Kaya, I don't even know what that is. Um, Shadlock, never heard of that one. So, chicken wing wood, don't know what that is. So, I have a feeling uh, I live in the southeast United States. I uh, might have different trees at my disposal than most of them. So, let's look at this piece as well. And I just think I've got a splinter. Maybe not. All right, 10, 14, 15. So I also have a pin meter. I just got this one. This this is the newer one, but they they've been pretty much in agreement. So let me cut this one into blanks too, and then I'll get this in the kiln. I can show you that. I have a vacuum kiln that's home built that works most of the time. It's kind of kludgy, but I like it. So, um, however, I guess we need to figure out. I'm gonna leave that one as is because it may warp and twist a little in the kiln. So I can cut it down after if I need to. So what I think I'll do is I'll just cut right through the pith and then I'll uh, put it through the joint here a time or two to go a little further back. see because I have my arm in the way so so yeah so, they're pretty good you can see the pith see that dark line pretty much the whole way so that's that's the amount I can't use this one's a bigger question because of this crack <laughs> Take that through the jointer. Actually, I may not bother. I gotta be able to find the center though. I know that side's straight because that other one jointed pretty cleanly. I really don't know about that one. I'll take it over there in a minute. Let's do this big old piece. Let's just, so I'm just going to cut that sliver off. I might end up taking it through the uh, jointer just to flatten it out. But man, I'm just trying to get rid of that pith right there because that's the part that's going to crack. Because well, it didn't feel wet, but the moisture meter told us otherwise, right? So.
see, I thought I had a straight line, but this dips down. And when I'm cutting, if I turn a circle on this side, kind of try to think I've got the center, and then I get to this middle and it's not as thick as I think it is, I'm in trouble. So if I square the whole thing up before I mark the center, then I know I've actually got the full width of the wood. Even if I do have to waste some of it doing this. All three of these are to make the same size thing, which seems like an incredible waste of wood. But I can't really cut that any smaller unless it's too small. So let's put them all on the kiln and uh, see what happens to them. All right, I'd be willing to bet you have never seen one of these before. This is my homemade homemade vacuum kiln. I found an instructable and largely followed it, but some of the stuff they did didn't work for me. I built this, it's six feet long, uh, to make my fireplace mantle out of. At the time I did not have a heater on the inside and I would run a heated blanket on the outside of it. That made an oak log that roughly filled a large portion of this take about six months to dry with me tending to it daily so uh, since then I've added the heater but I only I needed something metal I got some sheet metal this only goes uh, maybe two feet in three feet in it does not do the full length because I don't ever dry things full length anymore but you know I don't want to cut it off either so uh, I don't like things laying all the way on the bottom because they end up sitting in water when you let the pressure off. Okay, got a couple pieces of plywood. Rest assured, you didn't miss much. Everything's in here. This thing gets hot. So we get the cover and put it on. So this took a bunch of trial and error because I didn't want, originally, I did not want to drill any holes in the pipe because I didn't know how hard it would be to seal them. i since kind of figured out it probably wouldn't have been too bad because that's what I did with these wires. But I've had to re-glue this a time or two. Basically just use PVC cement. And, uh, and these bolts do there. So what I've got here is a pressure gauge and a relief valve, valve here, and a drain. So let's close all our valves and turn on our pump. So this is a vacuum pump. It's made for pumping up brake lines. Uh, not super expensive. I think they've gone up some. I think I got it for like a hundred bucks and now they're a little more than that. But made to where it can basically run forever without, uh, well, you'll end up going up your fluid, but it doesn't hurt the pump to run even when everything's already at full vacuum. So, that gauge is moving a little bit. Oh, I didn't explain what this is. So this is a piece of 12 inch, 12 inch PVC pipe. I don't understand why this nut won't thread on any of these. I knew one of them was a little finicky, but, but yeah, it'll work on that one. 12 inch PVC pipe. This is a piece of Corian countertop or solid surface countertop. Maybe it's that bolt that uh, I got from a cabinet shop or a countertop shop. They were kind enough to give it to me. Uh, we've got the same thing on the other side. Uh, this one obviously I have to remove. The other side is removable, but I have never removed it because this one uh, I never really had thought about how hard it is to cut something this big perfectly square so it wouldn't leak and uh, after a lot of trial and error I got this to seal so I, I routed I should have showed you I've got, I routed a, a circle in it and filled it with gasket material and uh, so I have to be careful not to over tighten these or I'll break that glue 
Now, honestly, I don't need it to be super tight because the vacuum will pull on it eventually, but it will if I don't tighten it a decent amount. Um, so I'm already at five. Perfect vacuum's 30. This is supposed to get to 29.5 or something like that, which is really, really low. Uh, occasionally I'll get there. Usually I never get quite all the leaks out. Well, that's not true. It'll stay there for days, but I guess with fresh fluid or whatever, maybe it'll happen, but usually I get about 29 even, somewhere 28, 29, and that's generally good enough. So if you're unfamiliar with the vacuum kiln, Basically, if you go to your basic physics of the flash point of water, um, you lower the pressure, boiling point goes down. So, just like you go to Colorado and you have to boil rice for longer because it, it boils at a lower temperature. You can boil anything water, I guess. So, similar with this, you pull a vacuum on it, and especially with that heater, which I'll turn that on too. Uh, so, I've got a 12 volt power supply up here that I got at Radio Shack while it was closing. And then this is a little thermostat that controls some heaters. Um, I don't remember what I had it set on, but whatever I had it on before is fine. It runs in Celsius, so I always have to convert it. But basically, with the flash point of water being what it is, when I pull a good vacuum on this, every bit of moisture that's on the outside of that wood is going to evaporate and boil off like that. And then the, the liquid's going to even out again to, you know, it's just like a sponge, you get a wet spot, it equals out to the dry spot, and what's on the outside evaporates really fast. So this can take, if, I, if this was a traditional kiln where you have to heat something up and circulate hot air around it, for pieces this small it might only take a couple of days, but for a, a log it would take years. Um, in theory I could do a pretty good sized log in a week, uh, and I've done I've done some pretty decent sized pieces, you know, about like that in a week. So, um, I've had reasonably good luck with it. Occasionally it'll dry too fast and it'll crack. Usually that happens right along the pith, so hopefully since I cut the pith off that won't happen. Uh, this thing gives you kind of diminishing returns. You'll get to halfway real quick and think you're, you know, two more minutes and I'm there and it'll be another 20 before it actually gets all the way up to 29. So. I will uh, turn this off and go do something else for a few minutes and then we'll come back and see where it is. So I haven't decided yet if this is going to be a whole shop series or if it's just going to be, you know, making this one, but just in case, uh, while we're waiting on that, I can show you a couple other things. So this is a, uh, going to be a bowl. I turned the outside of it, but got down to some pretty hefty cracks. But it's really pretty what's well, plum wood uh, from a friend's plum tree. You don't get a whole lot of that, obviously. I can't go to Home Depot and buy plum. So uh, what I did, I'm mixing up epoxy. And uh, I took uh, an old printer cartridge, uh, did a laser printer. And you take a little bit of the toner out of that and mix it up with the epoxy to turn it black. Um, black seems to work best. You could do clear, but it's more noticeable black actually it seems to hide the best so i'm filling the cracks with that it this stuff runs and it's it's real but it just got real thick i don't know how to do this with gloves because it's real sticky you now but because it's so thick now it'll take another day to actually get hard but with it this thick hopefully i can get in some of these cracks on the side so i've already done that side the problem is it just runs off the top so as it's been thickening up, I started this maybe an hour ago, as it's been thickening up, I, uh, I've been adding more to it. But this bowl, uh, you can see, is pretty much finished. I, I, I may be able to, I want it a little shinier. I just put oil on it, so I'll grab it with this. Um, but if that's as good as I can get it, we'll see how shiny it is tomorrow. Uh, I've just been doing it with tongue oil. I used to use lacquer on everything. I like lacquer, but it's real shiny and not, it's not always look good. This one is for a, from a burl from, I don't, even, I don't even know what kind of tree it was. It was probably sweet gum because we got a lot of that around here. Um, it was in the woods and I 
just kind of cut it off with a chainsaw and stuck it in the corner about four years ago and it's just been sitting there but you can see all the complex all those lines that are in there i thought it was kind of cool so that's not real useful since it's got cracks all over but hopefully my wife thinks it's pretty all right it's running pretty fast we're at 25 already like i say we want to get to 29 and a half and that can be a challenge. If you wait too long, this, uh, so this pump, here, I'll show you the pump. So this is just an air compressor hose. I really don't know why it doesn't collapse right there, but it doesn't. Um, really just standard air fitting, but I had to use, yeah, anyway, it doesn't, you don't care. Um, there's oil in here that gets dirty because it's pulling in the volatile stuff from the wood. So you gotta every once in a while, maybe every fifth or tenth time you use it, you gotta drain that oil and filter it or else just pour it out and get new. Um, and if you let this run too long, you'll start to see water vapor coming out the top. It just starts pulling. Uh, only thing that's left is water vapor because that's what's going out of the wood. Um, which you'd think would be fine, but it also gets kind of a light haze of oil all over the room. So usually try not to let it go that long. But as you can imagine, since it's not really, it doesn't hurt the pump to leave it running extra really, other than, you know, using up my clean oil. Sometimes I just leave this and go watch TV for a little while and then come back, forget about it, and, you know, an hour later I come back and the whole room's got a haze in the air. But, again, doesn't really hurt anything. Just kind of uses up my oil. And we're getting close. Could probably turn it off now, but let's see just how close we can get to 30. It's actually remarkably well. I'll show you this. This is that bowl that came from the burl I was telling you about. This is a piece of that. Um, this is a pretty big burl. I don't remember where that bowl came out. But yeah, you can see all the basically hollow on the inside. Well, not hollow, just kind of just weird. A bunch of lines. But I don't know what I'm going to do with this piece because I can't really picture a good bowl out of that. But you can't always picture them until you get them halfway done. I will show you, I've, I've got a piece of oak over here. So this is a piece of the same tree that I made my mantle out of. So this is what was in there. It's just a small piece. What's amazing to me, I had never really tried this before. I had some paraffin wax, or I don't even know what kind of wax it was. I mean, it was candle making wax. And first I cut the pith out of here. Maybe that's the last time I'll say pith. I don't know. I seem to say that a lot. But I cut it out because I knew that's what made the crack. And it made a crack. And then I covered this wax. And like I say, it's been at least, it's probably been three years. And there is, and I painted both sides. And I did, yeah, it's got wax on it too. There is not a crack in this thing. It's kind of amazing. So, I don't know if, it, I guess there could be a crack under the bark. Kind of curious, uh, curious what kind of moisture we're going to register. Nine, four, five, twelve, eight. That's pretty impressive because I didn't run it through. Well, that's still saying 10, 13. Maybe it hasn't dried all that much. It's just... So when you seal it off like this, what happens, from what I understand, is uh, it can, the water can still get out through the bark, but it's much slower. And that's what keeps it from cracking, especially when it's so slowly. So. If you turn a lot on the lathe, you'll see guys don't bother with kilns. What they'll do is they'll get roughly the right size and uh, then just put it away for a year or two and let it dry in the corner. All right, so now I'm wondering, I didn't check to make sure this gauge was at zero because it, it's past 30 and that's impossible if it's accurate. So I should have... Uh, should have made sure it was calibrated but you know what 
I'm sure it's good enough. So let's seal that off. And I'm gonna leave the heater running. Um, it doesn't get super hot, so 40, I think it must be, I don't actually remember what it's set on. 50, oh, it's set on 50, so 50 degrees Celsius, so 150, 125, so not even really all that hot. Uh, and in fact, I've done 80 degrees Celsius before. 50 may be a little low, actually. Problem is you don't want it, you want it to conduct all the way through the wood. If you get it real hot on one side and then that part dries faster, you can get cracking. So since they're so thin, I can leave them on 50. They might have dried even without the heater, honestly. But um, this has multiple fail safes. So this is a thermostat. So that should keep it from ever getting too hot. That's a 12 volt power supply. So if it ever, you know, run away current, it'll shut itself off. And I've got thermocouples on the metal so that if ever if it ever gets super hot, they'll shut it off too. So I feel pretty comfortable leaving it uh, down here because it'll it'll stay this way for days and just kind of run on its own. And uh, the big thing I'll come back and check tomorrow or maybe even an hour or two from now is see if that gauge has moved. If it's not where it is right now, then I have a leak, and by tomorrow it'll be down to zero. So, um, but yeah. Till that wood's dry, there's nothing else I can do. So I will bid you adieu.